Hello everybody, my name is Ratnos and welcome to my Mythic Silken Court Guide. This fight's a doozy, there's a lot happening here. I'll put some links to raid plans and weak auras and stuff in the description below and I'll show them off as they happen, but this fight is quite a lot. I'm going to try my best to explain everything. So starting off, at the very beginning of the fight you need to split up into two groups of ten. Uh, and these people will get inside the circle of one of the two bosses. If you don't do this, you will just get killed. And you will get a permanent buff for the rest of the fight, either the Mark of Paranoia or the Mark of Rage. Uh, and you need to split your group up into two of ten. We split it up. Two tanks were blue. Obviously two healers into each team. We put all of our evokers into the red team. Uh, we put our DKs in the blue team. The blue team is generally the one that's kind of allowed to be under the scarabs and meleeing them. Any red melee aren't allowed to do that. So uh, we put like our enhancement shaman, our rogue, and our havoc DH and red team. Uh, and then there are a couple of specific teams we did for this as well. So this is the echo strategy that we used on this fight. There are a couple different strats you can use for this boss. I'm not going to claim this one is necessarily better than the liquid one, but it's what we did and it, it worked okay for us. So um, I'll kind of talk thing by thing as this fight happens with all of the special assignments and stuff. So yeah, we, we've split up. We've gotten our, our 10 and 10. Um, first thing that happens is we get a frontal from the Scarab boss. Now the frontals from the Scarab boss are blue frontals. They always target a random person on the blue team. Frontals from the, the tall boss will always target somebody from the red team. So we call those red frontals and blue frontals. So we get first thing we get is a blue frontal. It targets the blue that we're all stacked up over here. So we Stampeding Roar and we move to the side uh, of this boss and we get to keep hitting this boss. Um, these two can't be stacked until that finishes, and then we can start moving the boss. Uh, the boss does a tank hit there. We have that tank hit hit our DK, so that our DK then can not be tanking that boss, and I can tank the boss instead, and our DK can do grips after this. Now, the next mechanic that comes out here is Web Bomb. Web Bomb targets six people on the red team preferring ranged. So you should set up to have exactly six red ranged. Now, the way that we do this is you're going to need to make three web teams, right? Web connections. And we have that set up with some special teams. So we have three teams. One of them is two red evokers. One of them is a blue mage and a red warlock. And the other one is a blue mage and a red... Uh, Disc Priest for us, although Holy Priest would work too. Any Healing Priest, right, would work for that. Um, red Ranged Healer, right? So those are our three teams that have the job of actually getting a Web Bomb and spawning it. So what we do is when this Web Bomb comes out, we have the three, three Red Ranged are just standing over here. They're baiting a Web Bomb here. Those Web Bombs are just going to sit there for the rest of the fight. We're going to ignore them. The three or the two reds that are paired up with blue people are spawning their web bombs near the middle of the room. Uh, and then one of the two evokers that's on a red team with another red evoker is on the wall and one is not on the wall and spawning their web bombs. So you can see we've got three web bombs spawned in specific positions. Uh, these people go to those same positions every time. And then the other three people that are spawning useless web bombs just stack them up against the wall. Um, so that comes out now. Those web bombs spawn now. And those people will then need to get with their teammate inside their web bomb and then touch the middle of their web bomb to trigger the connection between the two of them. Now, throughout this entire fight, whenever you get hit by Venomous Rain, which is just coming out now, or that web bomb hit, you will spawn a moat that needs to get soaked by a member of the other team. So that's part of the reason we do this this way is... The two evokers will be spawning some extra, they're red players, so they'll be spawning extra red moats that need to get soaked by blue people. The other two web teams that are done near the middle of the room have one red and one blue person, so they can each just rotate around and soak each other's orbs, and we don't have any problems there, because if you ever run within a few feet, right, within if this blue circle, if there's ever a red player within this blue circle, we both die. Um, so that is why this strategy is done this way. Um, so you can see this web bomb, or the, the Venomous Rain comes out. We spawn a bunch of blue motes over here, a bunch of red motes behind the boss. And now we rotate around the boss, clockwise in this case, around the boss. Um, we also have our evokers, have, they, they got one of the web bombs back here, and they linked up with each other. So they've spawned some extra reds back here. And you can soak one or two motes of the other color. If you don't soak them, it will explode and give everybody a stack of a debuff. If you do soak them, it will only give you a stack of the debuff. If you ever get to three stacks of the debuff by either soaking three or soaking two and then one goes exploded somewhere or three explodes somewhere, you die. 
Uh, so that's very bad. You try not to die as much as you can. So here, for instance, I soak these two. And uh, the red team is now rotated around and is soaking all the blue orbs we dropped. If you ever stack the Venomous Rain such that there are two people getting hit by it, you'll both drop two moats instead, which is very lethal. People will die. If there's ever two moats stacked on top of each other, it's very likely to kill somebody. You need to open your microphone and say, double, there's a double on red. And you can identify it by looking at the swords that are floating above the moats. If you see there's two swords, then you can identify that it's a double moat, uh, because that's easier than actually seeing there's two orbs. The orbs kind of stack into each other. Um, so that's the rule for that. Now, with scarabs coming out here, these scarabs need to get gripped under the boss. So having at least two DKs is nice, so you have enough grips to just get these under the boss. They have a damage reduction for a little while, and they fixate on the closest person once they finish burrowing out of the ground. Um, they can kill people very easily. Non-tanks that, that are fixated by these should try not to get hit by them too much, uh, because they do a lot of damage, and they stack up an increasing damage taken from all sources on you. And also, they can crit you and kill you for fun. So... Uh, don't let them auto you. Don't do that. And we try and grip them under the bosses um, as fast as we can. So that's part of the reason I'm tanking both bosses here so the other the DK can be focusing on that. Uh, in this phase as well, the tall one does put a poison on your tanks. Dispel that. Like if it gets above like five stacks, you should definitely try and dispel that uh, as much as possible. Uh, okay, here you can see what the, the red-blue pairs are doing in the middle of the room. You see that they're both, I guess it's under the raid frame, so you can't see, but you'll have to take my word for it. They're both under, they're both inside this bigger web AoE, and one of them has walked in and triggered this, and now you see there's a red moat and a blue moat there, and they both just do a little circle and soak each other's moats, and now they both have a web line, and they stretch it across the middle of the room. Um, so here you'll see there's a red evoker pretty close to the blue melee as well. You gotta be careful of this. This caused a lot of wipes for us, was people running into this person. That person and the melee have to be very careful of each other, uh, and the boss... We use Ursul's Vortex here to try and get the Scarabs all just nice under the middle of the boss. We get a fun charge here, uh, and you have three lines, so the boss gets stunned. Um, and then you it's taking double damage here, so Mad Queen's Mandate, really good for that double damage amp window. Any kind of effects like that, really good to send into the boss uh, during this burn. Spread for Venomous Rain. And now we're going to go and soak each other's orbs. The tall boss has two different positions that it can jump to here. Either up in front or over to the left from our current position. You have it, we have it, we had, we called it the normal spot because that's what's in the echo kill video. And then the cringe spot because we didn't have that in their kill video to figure out what we we're supposed to do. So we had to figure out from like watching Prague to do that. Either way, it's the same. So on this one, I, on this kill, I think it moved to the cringe spot, but either way you basically do the same thing. Um, so here comes a frontal. And then what happens after this frontal is you take the boss and you stack it on top of the other one. So this is the cringe spot, and you just move the boss such that they're stacked up. If it's in the normal spot, you do the same thing. Just blue are kind of on the outside of the room, and red are on the inside middle of the room, uh, running towards that new location. And you take the boss over here, stack them up nice and, nice and tight. Uh, and then here comes a fun set of mechanics, um, if you have fun with annoying mechanics. Uh, so we have a bunch of ads spawning that need to get gripped under the bosses. We also get a blue frontal here, so the Scarab's going to pick a blue person at random and aim a frontal at them. So, your blue people that are on those ranged teams that are out in the middle of the room, because your two blue people that are on those, those, red, those teams with red, red people need to be in the middle of the room later. What they do is they go off to the side, and actually they both ice block in this section. They ice block before the Venomous Rain hits them, and they stay in that block until after that frontal is either baited on them or not. Um, and that way they can avoid baiting this frontal through the red or through the middle of the room. Uh, this frontal either targets a blue melee, in which case it's fine, or it targets one of those two blue mages and they are in an ice block, safe and sound. Uh, un you know, if, if they get targeted, it's okay. And they also ice block so we aren't spawning random blue moats over in Narnia where they would not be soakable. Uh, so that is an important thing to do here. That frontal finishes and uh, then... This, the web bombs happen immediately after this. So the three red range that are spawning useless web bombs need to quickly get over to the wall as soon as the venomous rain happens. And the other three red people that are part of the teams uh, instead spawn their bombs, two in the middle of the room and one over here on the side. Uh, and then again, this one's the evoker one, so a rescue is used for those two red evokers to just quickly get that bomb. And these multicolor teams get their lines there. Uh, we get extra red motes as a result back there. We rotate through the boss again. Uh, the rule here basically is the red are rotating around the boss and the blue run kind of through the boss. 
uh, to get to their other side and soak where all those moats used to be. Then we get our next charge here. Uh, again, Ursula's Vortex, really good for this one. And charge comes through. And then we just get to keep hitting the boss for a while through this damage amp. Uh, this is a good spot for two minutes as well to be potentially used, or for potions rather to be used, depending on what your CD timings look like uh, on this charge. It can be good. Uh, you'll still get them for lust at the end of the fight. Now we move the boss to the middle of the room, and we have these two world markers indicating where our team should stand for this intermission. And the rule for this intermission is you want to start to the left of your marker. Now, there are two, the people that are on these teams, right? The people that are web teams with each other are also intermission teams, and they're kind of standing back, doing their own thing, cycling around, rotating with each other. The, the crucial insight for this intermission is that it is exactly the same slices every single pull. There is no variance on these slices. So if you stand in, if you have these world markers, it is the exact same set of slices every time. So with that, we know that if we start to the left of our markers, uh, the first pie slice is always going to come right on top of us, and then we can start moving, and the, the marker will be the right edge of the first pie slice with these markers. And we all move right, except for those two people on each side. You can see that there's a red and a blue that are kind of their own team here, and they're rotating and soaking their own orbs over there. And we all just run over, and again, you soak one or two of these red motes. Once this last one finishes of this first cast, we do a scoot left. So everybody needs to try and get one slice over into this area that just got hit. Try and get as far left as you can so that you spawn these motes in this new slice because it's the one that's about to get hit. And then for the rest of this, we're just always moving right. We do a red light stop here. Like, we do a stop here. There's actually guilds that keep moving in this spot, which I think is kind of psychotic, but you can just stop here after you do two slices on this move. You can wait for this one to go, and then you can move in. Here's a double. There's a double red, so this was calmed over voice. There's a double on red, right? Very easy to miss this. Very easy to accidentally not see that. Soak one earlier. Go to soak another. Oops, I soaked two. I'm dead. Uh, so be very careful with that. But if you call it, then somebody can be like, oh, I'll soak the double, and they just don't soak a first one. We spread again, and we keep moving right. And uh, you see we have this weak ore here. This is a liquid weak ore. I'm not sure if it's public. Um, I'm sure they'll public their weak ore soon. Um, but you, the goal basically is to break this shield around bef sometime just before this next Entropic Barrage 5 would come out. So try and break the shield with maybe five seconds left on this cast. Again, there's another double, red double right there. Uh, so that one needs to be carefully soaked. You can see I'm staying away from it because I already have one stack. Uh, but I can soak this one because it's a single. And I get another stack. And it's all good. All the motes have been soaked. The two bosses come up, and uh, yeah, the reason you want to delay that, ideally, you can you can push a little bit earlier than that, but it's just nice to have time to soak all those motes, and it's good for CD timing as well uh, to do that. So, we get into phase two. Now, phase two begins with a blue frontal. We actually have some blue players playing kind of to the sides of this boss, so it's lucky whenever they get targeted, but it doesn't really matter because everybody can just move. If it targeted the bulk of the blue people, that would be fine as well. You dodge this frontal. During this phase, the, the skinny boss will do Void Bolts now. So this is not a Poison Dispel anymore, it's a Magic Dispel. Uh, but your Magic Dispels are being used for the main mechanic on this fight. So what you want to do is you want to figure out some healers who don't need to Dispel for a while and have them Dispel your tanks as they're getting above 5 stacks. That can be really valuable. Stone Form is also really nice if you're playing a Dwarf uh, for this part of the fight too, so they can, you can just Stone Form if things are getting sketchy. Um, but yeah, okay, so Frontal comes out. Next mechanic is Web Vortex. Now, this mechanic is very easy to not understand, but once you do understand it, it's actually very forgiving. So what the boss is going to do is it's going to pick one group, either red or blue, and then grip them in and spawn moats under where they came from. And then two seconds later, it's going to grip the other group into the middle and spawn moats where they came from. So our rule for this is that we have split up our entire raid into either running left or right, every time this is targeted, th this comes out. Um, so here's our left and right groups for this, right? We have a red group left and a red right and a blue left and a blue right. If you are the first team gripped in, you will then go either left or right according to what this, to your assignment. And probably you'll break the webs that are spawned. Not probably, but you'll break some webs most of the time from doing this. Sometimes you'll run in the same direction as whoever you get webbed to. You, if, if nobody's dead, it will web you to the closest person usually but maybe they're already getting webbed to somebody else, so then it'll web you to the next closest person. It'll usually web you to close people as you're getting gripped in. We didn't bother trying to manipulate that. We just said, okay, half the raid will run right, half the raid will run left, right? Um, so wh whichever group gets in first, say it's the blue team that gets gripped in first here, 
I would just start running right because I always run right. And some people would run left. And if, I, if me and whoever I was webbed to are running different directions, that's great. Our webs will snap. If we're going in the same direction, then we're going to have to break our webs as soon as we get to the other side. Now, if we get gripped in second, we can instead run through where the moats were from the other team as we run out and actually grab those moats along the way. Um, if we get gripped in first, we kind of have to loop back in and grab those moats later. But again, you need to make sure that you get out of the path of where the other group is about to get gripped in, right? Uh, so let's, let's see that in action here. So first grip's going to be coming out, and it's the red team is getting gripped in first. So they're going to run left, right around us, right? They're going to kind of, we're, we're in a nice loose stack here. You don't want to double, you don't want to stack tightly because then you'll spawn double moats, right? You're spawning moats where you're getting gripped from. So a nice loose spread here. And then you're getting yanked in. Bunch of moats are spawning. We are staying here. And all of red is in the middle of the boss. And they are splitting left and right around us, right? See this? They're going around us because they don't want to run into us as we're all getting gripped in here. So this is about to be lethal. This entire cone here is about to be lethal uh, if there are any red people still there. So they're getting out of the way. We are gripped in. And because we are the second grip, we can just run out through these moats. So I can pick up two moats on my way out. Our webs get snapped. Uh, pretty much instantly everybody can snap their moats. And there's a couple of moats still outstanding, which we just run back in after that AoE and finish soaking them. Now, here comes the Dispels. That's right, it's more mechanics time. Uh, so five people get afflicted with a Dispel. Uh, you can use the Northern Sky Week or pack to handle assigning your Dispels and putting the markers on people, or putting numbers on people's nameplates. I think it has that functionality as well. Um, and what you want to do is you need to dispel these under the boss. Um, there's a duration on this debuff. So if you dispel one onto the boss and you don't dispel the next one soon enough, it will expire and you will wipe because you need all five of these to get dispelled on the boss. The way that it works is, uh, at least with the, the Liquid Pack, I think the Northern Sky has the same uh, logic too, but if not, uh, what we did is we had our blue people, pr we preferred blue melee, then blue ranged, then red melee, then red ranged would go under the boss in that order. Um, so you could kind of know when it was your time. The middle of the skinny boss's hitbox is banned. You're not allowed to be there unless you're the person who's about to get dispelled. And so we would, just, we would say, uh, person's name, let, let's go back a little bit. So here come the debuffs are coming out right now as we're running out. So we can see instantly, okay, we've got our we've got our five debuffs. Physical is our first dispel. So we'd say, okay, physical, get under the boss. Physical in two, one, dispel. And then physical would get dispelled. And then I'm not an orc in two, one, dispel. And he's under the boss, gets dispelled. Terrasant in two, one, dispel. He gets dispelled. Then Derek in two, one, dispel. And then now the boss still has five seconds on the cast time. So we hold our last dispel for a few extra seconds and dispel it right at the end there. The reason you want to do the first four kind of quick uh, and then the last one is the one that you hold is that each of these stacks actually gives the boss a 20% damage taken increase. So most of your raid right now should be hitting the skinny boss because it has an 80% increased damage taken phase. And the longer you delay that fifth dispel, the more value you're getting out of that. Uh, and then you get an 100% increased damage taken during the stun. So that is good to do. I'm hitting the other boss here because I'm the tank. I'm making sure I have threat and stuff and my positioning and things and excuses. But I should probably be hitting the, the skinny one right now as well uh, for the extra damage value too. Uh, so then our last dispel is Timber Maw. He just gets under the boss. He just waits there. If you dispel onto somebody else, it's not the end of the world. You just need to adapt uh, and you need to keep going. And then you'll just need to do your last dispels more quickly. But if it happens it, often, that's a problem that you do need to solve uh, because it will wipe you a lot of the time that it does happen. Uh, we also have Scarabs coming here, so that's why I'm tanking the boss here. The way that it works is at the start of P2, you want your DK tanking the first piercing strike, and that will set them up to be free to do the grips that they want to do uh, during this phase again, because I can be tanking the boss for like 30 seconds uninterrupted here while the, the grips come out. Uh, last spell comes out, bang, interrupt the boss, hit the boss, another Mad Queen's Mandate goes into that boss while it is stunned for me. Uh, now we get to stack, hard stack on our markers. So... Everybody stacks on the opposite color marker as their group. Uh, and I'm marked with a square. Eve is marked with a, an X. Uh, Eve, the creator of the raid plan, by the way. If you do want to yoink a lot of the strats, we do have a lot of this in a raid plan. We made some changes to these, but Eve made this, uh, this great raid plan that was the initial plan for a lot of how we did this fight. So uh, if you're curious about exactly what our ideas were here, that is where those come from. Um, but yeah, he's the captain of the red team. I'm the captain of the blue team. We pixel stack on each other here, on, on our, ourselves on the opposite color marker near the middle of the room. And uh, now there's gonna be two frontals. We got a red frontal, the red people dodge that to their left. We got a blue frontal, the blue people dodge that to their left. Now, 
the skinny boss will teleport to a random spot on the edge of the room. What happens here is we need to make a call of which side the red team is going to go to and which side the blue team is going to go to. So with the boss teleporting here, you could go either side, right? Red could go to the left or they could go to the right and blue could get kind of over further to the right or over further to the left. Either one, we have enough time to do. You do need to use movement CDs here to make it happen and you need to react quickly. So the call gets made here, red, right, which is fine. You can make either side work. Red, right gets called though, and that means blue is going left. So stampeding roar, blue just needs to get heading leftish and forwardish of the boss and getting a nice spread because now we get a web vortex almost immediately here. Um, so one advice here as well is you can see where the boss is gonna teleport. We're going back a little bit. We get the two frontals. We dodge our frontals to the left. Then the boss casts a teleport. As soon as it's teleporting, it faces where it's going to teleport. So you can start pre-thinking about uh, what we had as, as Eve would call red right or red left based on where it went to. Uh, so he would be already thinking about it and he'd be calling red right. And immediately red is running to the right and blue is running to the left as a result of that call. And now here comes the web vortex. Again, either team can be gripped first here. Um, whichever team gets gripped first is going to the left and the right. According to, again, I always run right if I'm going to the left and the right. And whichever team is getting gripped second, we'll just be able to run kind of straight and go grab all of our, our moats. So we're running to the right and the, and the left, blue team is, and red team just goes and picks up all these beautiful moats that are easy, they're all spread from each other, and they can go and pick them all up nice and safely. They're doing that. We pick up some of these reds on our way out, and then the ones that we didn't get, we come and get on our way back in. Easy. Another set of dispels comes out and adds now. Um, so... The dispels have to happen under the boss here. What we want to do on this set is ideally we want to dispel three under the boss before it teleports to the middle of the room. So we do one pretty quick, two goes under boss, gets dispelled pretty quick, three goes under boss, gets dispelled pretty quick, and then the boss teleports to the middle of the room where we're going to do four and then five. Um, so we that's the plan with this set here. We got a blue frontal. Bait this blue frontal away from the middle of the room. So you want to make a call here of blue just bait towards the wall so you don't bait this frontal towards the middle of the room. Adds are getting fixated on people, and we're, again, gripping Ursul's Vortexing in the middle of the room, you know, killing them near the middle of the room, bringing the two bosses together-ish, uh, and we get our stun on the, the skinny boss, and again, we should be hitting that skinny boss during this damage amp uh, because it's taking extra damage right now. Then we get to the second intermission. Hooray, we've done it. Is that, it, it was that easy this whole time. It was that easy. Uh, so now, before the second intermission, you can be in a bunch of different positions in the room. We always reset before this intermission, to our color markers, slightly again to the left of our color markers. Um, there's a couple of different configurations that this intermission can run in, but you kind of learn them as you do this fight a couple of times. Um, a certain idiot does die on this particular pull, again, to showcase how it looks like if you die, but uh, it is, it, I think it's good to just always, during this like 10 seconds of breathing room, we just always have blue team rotate towards blue marker and red team rotate towards red marker. During this phase, there's no need to do the thing with the teams of people soaking each other's orbs, I don't think anymore. Those people are just part of the group now as well. Uh, and we're just have, we just have two groups of 10. Boss runs into the middle of the room. And the goal is to beat the third set of orb drops in this phase. It's actually a pretty forgiving shield. You don't need to stop damage in this phase like you do in the first intermission. Just as soon as you can get out of this intermission is good. Um, so we rotate around the boss. And again, our goal is to soak. This is a dangerous spot here. If you try and go get one of these orbs, you're going to get hit by the spike. You can bop people out of the spikes if they get hit by it, but usually they're just going to die. So the rule here is if you need to not hit the boss for a while, just run out and don't hit the boss. You can see the entire blue team basically runs out, doesn't hit the boss for a bit. All these orbs are kind of getting attacked for a little while. Somebody got spiked. Uh, they died. That's what it looks like if you get spiked. That's not good. Not the only idiot to die in this intermission, though. Uh, again, so now we now we stack up after we soaked all those first orbs. We spawn our second set of orbs, and again, we rotate right. Uh, this can be a good spot for movement CDs, too. And again, we're kind of zoned off of everything here. We pick up the orbs as best we can. We've got another spiked gamer back there. There's what happens if you run over three. If you run over three, you die. That's why I did that. So that's, that's what that looks like to show you. You just instantly die. But luckily, you can get rezzed. On PTR, you couldn't. On PTR, you were perma-dead if that happened. So that's one of the reasons this fight was easier than it, than it was on PTR. Uh, okay, so we're down a player. Doesn't matter. You can be down. Players can die. You can lose DPS, and you can still kill this boss. It's not the end of the world. Um, so do get ready to kill this boss. Like, don't wipe this as soon as somebody's dead. It's not like Nexus Princess Kaiveza, free nerf or whatever, where you needed just every single person alive to have a chance of killing the boss. So... P3 starts, we're down a red gamer, that's okay. 
Uh, if you have a lot of players dead and you're trying to make prog, you should generally res the person on the team that is underrepresented, so that because otherwise you're going to get just uh, more moats of that color, right? Uh, the soak to moat ratio gets bad. Um, but also you'd need to res, you know, tanks, healers, people with important jobs. So uh, if it's all things being equal, that's who you should choose to res during prog. So the boss uh, comes up where it went down, the skinny boss. So you can already know where that's going to be. We ping it as well to get everybody aware of it. And there's also, you can see the boss there as it is spawning. Uh, this boss, what we do here is red moves to the side of the boss. And blue, we kind of drag the two bosses together. We cleave them for a little bit. Uh, and then red is going to bait a frontal here, and then they're going to move towards the wall. So a red frontal is going to come out soon. Again, the DK takes the first piercing strike of this phase. Uh, it doesn't. There's no more ads in this phase, so it doesn't really matter who takes the first one anymore. Uh, the red bait the frontal, and then they move towards the, the wall. Blue, we deal with this swarm, which is some raid damage. Uh, we're still cleaving a little bit, but we're getting ready now to all cheat towards the middle of the room because we're about to get a web vortex, and it's really good if blue can spawn our orbs towards the middle of the room. So it's okay to back up and not hit the boss for a bit here, uh, and just back up, not cleave, not hit the boss, spawn some nice orbs in the near the middle of the room. We all get gripped towards the boss. Whichever team gets gripped first has to go... Uh, well, okay, so this one's got special rules. I'm sorry, the, there were different rules for the other ones. But, so if blue gets gripped first here, we are going left and right. If we get gripped second, we're still going leftish and rightish, but we can, we can start clearing those moats. Red, if they get gripped first, they're just running to their right, uh, which I guess is my left. They'd be running over here. If they get gripped second, they can just run center towards this. But they don't do left-right on this set because they need to keep their webs. So they can't go to the different sides of each other. They all need to go in the same direction here. Um, so that is an important rule here. Red keep their webs uh, so that they can actually stun the boss. Because now in this phase, the boss does a charge again. So blue, we get gripped in. We go left-right. Red gets gripped in. And they all run mid. And they're all keeping their webs and soaking these moats mid. Uh, meanwhile, we run out. And we finish soaking our moats as best we can. Meanwhile, the boss is now doing a charge, but all of our red people have their webs in the middle of the room. And so uh, with one red player dead, we only get four webs. So if, if one of them breaks, it's okay. If two of them break, it's a wipe. Um, but yeah, they charge the boss. The boss gets stunned. We hit the boss for a little while. Now, red needs to immediately bait a red frontal such that it doesn't hit the blue team and move us off this boss here. Um, so red all back up towards the middle of the room, bait a beautiful red frontal, such that blue team can keep hitting. Uh, and then we're gonna now chase this boss. We're gonna chase the skinny boss. As soon as the entangled is over, we're all heading over towards the, the tall boss here. And there's another web vortex coming out. Now this one is just regular rules. We don't need the webs from this one. So we're breaking all the webs. So the first team that gets gripped in is going left, right, right? They're either, they're going according to their assignment, left or right. And the second team that gets gripped in is going leftish, rightish, and also can run forward and soak the moats. Um, along the way. So there's the first grip. There are, or actually they all, they, you just run, sorry, this, <laughs> this one's different. This one's different than that. This one, the first team that gets gripped in just runs to the middle of the room. And the second team that gets gripped in runs uh, and goes and grabs the moats and also does ideally left, right. So I should have gone right there. Um, but yeah, the first team that gets gripped in actually has to run towards the middle of the room on that one because there's just not enough room if they try to do left, right. There's not enough space for them and they need to be uh, red needs to be, they, they need to, I don't know. There's some logic. You have to. You have to do it that way. Sorry. Um, okay. Now we snap our webs here. Any webs that are still outstanding, we try and break. Now we get our next set of dispels. So uh, this is just dispels on the on the tall boss. This one's pretty easy. We want to do a dispel under the boss where, where it is. So physical gets dispelled. You can delay that first dispel for a couple of seconds so that the second one will, it's only lasts for 10 seconds on the boss. So you, if you do it insta, what we do is we only do one under the boss before it teleports, and then we do the remaining four in the middle of the room. If you do the first one insta, you need to do the second one quick before those 10 seconds are up. But if you delay it a little bit, you get a little bit more time. And you can see, yeah, there were still five seconds to spare. So if you do it fast enough, it's fine. Whoever's number two needs to be ready in the middle of the room, instantly gets dispelled. Number three gets under the middle, gets dispelled. Number four, this is big raid damage now. Every time you dispel, it does raid damage, and the other boss is casting Swarm. So this is a good spot for healer CDs. Um, this is where I'm innervating as well. And Dispel 5 comes in. We stun the boss, and we're all hitting the boss that is stunned because it's taking extra damage. Uh, so always be target swapping to the boss that is taking extra damage is the rule. Uh, okay, now what's going to happen here is blue is going to occupy the middle of the room, 
and red is going to chase this boss. Red is going to chase the tall boss to wherever it goes. Um, so the, the tall boss is going to look somewhere, teleport, and red is going to follow. Blue is going to get into the middle of the room because we want to leave our moats in the middle of the room because red is going to be soaking soon and also going to have web soon, and they're going to need to all be in the middle of the room. So that's where we need the moats to be. So blue form a nice loose spread in the mid, red bait another frontal towards the, the side, and then they go up against the wall. And then we get our next web vortex. So this one is the same as the first of this phase. It's uh, blue will always go left, right, or you know left, right-ish towards the moats if we're second. And red will either go right to, if they get first and then loop around towards mid, or they'll just go straight to mid and they keep their webs here. So they're getting grip first. So they're all gonna go right with each other. Look at that beautiful, all together, all those webs being preserved. And we, blue, are going to go left, right, forward, right? Leftish, rightish, and forward, soaking our, our moats along the way if we can. Now, the red people are all in the middle of the room with webs to each other, and they've all soaked, they've soaked these moats while this has been happening. Five debuffs have gone out. So we need to now dispel under the boss and also be clotheslining this boss at the same time. So uh, the, this is why blue dispels are first, right? This is one of the reasons why blue dispels are first, is we want to do two blue dispels under boss here during this time. We did those. That was sketchy as hell. That was extremely dangerous, what, what happened there. Um, so let's, let's watch that again here. I'll hit you and Alex G or dispels one and two. Look how fast they do this. One, two. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, actually, it, it changed the assignments midway through. So sometimes there's a travel time on those dispels coming out. So yeah, one, two, three... Oh, he died with it. Okay. Orc died with it, and it bounced on to... It bounced an extra stack onto Terra Sant M, so he has two stacks now. This also increases your damage taken and is an extra large dot, so he's in tremendous danger. Uh, so this is very sketchy, actually. Uh, but yeah, I'll hit you get dispelled under boss. Alex G is going to be up next and getting dispelled under boss uh, as soon as he can. Or the boss teleports to the side here. And we need to do that. It, t it teleports to the side, and then it teleports mid. It's weird. Um, but yeah, you can see there's only two seconds left of this debuff. So the first dispel being fast there, this is the spot where if you can delay that first dispel for a little bit and then get the second one. So the first one can be over on the side. The second one in mid really fast uh, is really good there. You need the very middle of the boss's hitbox to be free. So red needs to not be in the middle where that boss is teleporting to. And whoever is dispel number two basically needs to be right there ready to get dispelled. He goes, he gets dispelled just in time to refresh this stack. If you lose that stack, it's over. Um, so in the meantime, the Scarab boss is stunned right now and is taking extra damage, so everybody should be hitting the Scarab boss. I'm targeting the, the other one as an example of what not to be doing. Uh, okay, so we've now got two stacks on the boss. Terrasan has two stacks as well, so he'll just go under and get both of them dispelled onto the boss, uh, and the boss is up to four stacks now. And then Vioxy will get dispelled right before the end here. This is where you lust as well. Uh, because you go from a damage amp on one boss straight into a damage amp on the other boss, and you just hit it with as much damage as you've got. You can see now I'm targeting... That was a taunt. I had to, sw to target swap for a taunt there, so I wasn't just always targeting the exact wrong one, uh, but it wasn't good. I should have hit the, the Scarab when it was stunned more. Now we get towards the Berserk. So if you've done this fight with the kind of delayed intermissions as much as we have here, you get this Berserk right now. That's part of the reason we, delay the, we do the intermissions on the Cadence we do as well, is so that we get this Berserk right after all this raid damage and stuff has happened, uh, and the bosses aren't going to do anything for a while except for melee super hard. Uh, so here, I basically I still have 12 seconds of Incarn for a little while. Uh, we have a bunch of CDs on Snap. I also call uh, like PS and TD to go one on each of us, basically, uh, so that we get these externals rolling on us as we now have the bosses going berserk, starting to hit very hard for a little while, but tank defensives are pretty strong, so you can just hold for a little while. We have a bubble taunt as well, so you can survive for quite a while into this Berserk. The thing that's going to kill you is the next Swarm. Uh, once that comes out, that does a bunch of raid damage. It's going to kill everybody. So uh, you do the, the fight as long as you can here. Then you get deep into this Berserk. Your tanks start running out of defensives. You get to this Swarm, and you can see that ticks for a lot, but the bosses die before we do. That's it. That's Mythic Silken Court. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know if you have any questions. I will put links to all the resources that we had, all the the raid plan, the groups and stuff um, in the comments down below as much as I can. Yeah, it's a hard fight. It's a deceptive. It's a very hard fight. The thing to remember about this fight is a lot of the stuff, it'll do the same things every time. So you should always position the same way every time. 
learn that you, like the venomous rains in P1 always be in like the exact same spots for those uh, instead of kind of trying to figure it out on the fly each time and going to different spots. Pick a spot, stick with it. If you're going to change something, say something so that everybody can talk about it and understand what they need to then change uh, and why you're changing it and stuff. Same with the intermissions, just always kind of try and play in the same relative spots to everybody else. And uh, yeah, kill the scarabs, kill those scarabs, get them under the boss and kill them, stun them. Uh, you'll see stuff like kidney shots going onto them. That's really good. That keeps them from hitting people. Your damage almost never matters on this fight. Like we, th we had a lot of people dead on this fight. We still killed it. Uh, we could have done maybe another one percent or something before everybody would have died in the enrage there. And this was like a scuff pull with a lot of deaths. So uh, optimize the mechanics. The damage will be there if you're at this point. If you've killed Nexus Princess Kyveza, even post nerf, you have the damage for this encounter. I promise you. Do not optimize damage. Optimize mechanics, uh, and you will kill the boss much quicker. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope it helps. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Bye.